Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's One World's Mind Seminar. Uh, today we are pleased to have Professor Christopher Musco from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering in the Tandon School of Engineering at New York University. Uh, Professor Musco completed his PhD at MIT where he was advised by Jonathan Kellner. Prior to joining NYU, he was a research instructor at Princeton University. And today he will talk about robust active learning via leverage score sampling. So Professor Musco, whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. Great. Thank you, Santosh. And thanks so much for inviting me to uh, attend this seminar. I actually like somehow missed the boat on this seminar all of the uh, pandemic, and I wish I hadn't because you guys have had wonderful speakers, so I now hope to be a regular attendee. Um, yeah, so as Santosh mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about active learning via leverage score sampling, which is a, a, it's a pretty broad topic. This isn't a talk about one paper. It's about maybe like many papers I've worked on and that other people have worked on that but a topic that I've become really interested in, in the past couple of years. Um, I'll try to give you a broad overview of the topic. My understanding is we have roughly 50 minutes for the talk and 10 minutes for questions, but if anything's unclear, please feel free to interrupt me as we go, because I prefer it that way if, if uh, I don't mind interruptions for questions. Okay, so yeah, the title of the talk is Robust Active Learning via Leverage Course Sampling. I'm gonna be talking about a class of problems in statistics and machine learning, which are motivated by, um, applications where we want to use either statistical prediction or like machine learning models, but we don't have big data. So we have small data sets because the cost of collecting labeled data examples is really high. So uh, the first example you might think of is say experimental science. Like on the picture on the left, I have a plot that's showing the density of clay in soils in a, um, in a, in ocean bay. Uh, how do you figure out the density of clay in different areas of the bay? You literally have to dig holes or send a core down from a boat to measure the soil, have someone look at it, determine a number, and then move on to the next location. So in this domain, we might hope to predict uh, clay density in different areas, but collecting data or labeled data is extremely expensive. Um, another example I'm interested in is optimizing experimental conditions. So some of my collaborators at Tandon School of Engineering um, work in chemical manufacturing, chemical engineering in general, and they're interested in designing electrochemical processes where you replace the need for heat or fossil fuel dependency in producing in synthesizing chemicals with um, electricity, which can lead to uh, much better carbon impact because the electricity you can use uh, sustainable sources of electricity. And when they design these chemical processes, they figure out what the process is, but there's a million knobs to be turned, like. I'm pulsing electricity into some reactor. How long should the pulses be? What frequency should they be at? How, how uh, long should I turn off the electrical pulse at for? There's a ton of parameters they can change, which impact the efficiency of the, the reaction process. And one thing they could try to do is try all different choices of parameters and see how they did. Or they could try to use a machine learning model to efficiently learn the, like to quickly learn the, the trade-off between the parameters they choose and the efficiency of the chemical process that they're trying to, they're trying to optimize. So there, collecting samples is expensive because each sample corresponds to a set of reaction conditions, which requires a physical experiment. Okay, and then finally, my third example is a little bit different. So methods for learning from small data sets have also become increasingly important in machine learning driven methods for solving parametric differential equations or related problems like uncertainty quantification. So here the idea is you want to estimate some quantity of interest for a differential equation, possibly over a large parameter space. So like one very simple working example I use in this talk is you have some system which is governed by um, a damped harmonic, like a, a damped harmonic oscillator that's driven by a sinusoidal force. So think like someone singing and their voice is vibrating a glass or a car going over the road and there's sinusoidal bumps in the road so the car is bouncing up or down. You want to understand uh, when I run this, when I solve this equation, what is the maximum displacement of the oscillator? So like what's the maximum stretch in my springs? Uh, how would you do this? Well, the solution of the maximum is going to depend on constants governing your differential equation. The spring constant, how high is the friction? What's the driving frequency? What time period are we are we looking over to look at the maximum displacement? So to figure out what the maximum displacement is, I need to pick, figure out, look at those, choose those parameters and then solve the differential equation. Like I have two solutions here on the left and right. 
for different sets of parameters and look at the maximum. Okay, the question here is what if I wanna understand that maximum over a huge space of parameters? So a grid of possible values for the spring constant, friction, driving frequency, et cetera. How could I do that? I could just solve the differential equation many, many times, but the number of times I solve is growing exponentially in the parameter space. Or I can try to use a simpler machine learned or statistically fit model to approximate this quantity of interest like the maximum displacement. So in other words, solve the differential equation for a small set of parameters, get solutions. That's what I have on the right here. So this is like the parameter spaces. I'm only varying driving frequency in the spring constant. And then try to interpolate the remainder of the function, this quantity of interest, from the points that I, I, I solved the differential equation for on the right. So here, the cost of sampling is a computational cost. I can collect data, but every time I collect a data point, I need to do a computationally expensive operation, solve a differential equation. And I would like to do that few time, not, like, as few times as possible before using a simpler machine learning model to fit the entire Q of I survey. Okay, so those are like the high level applications. Um, one observation is that in many of these applications, it's expensive to collect data, but we have control over exactly what data examples we label. So we can choose where to dig our holes to sample the soil. We can choose what, how to set the parameters of the chemical reaction. We can choose what parameters to solve the differential equation for. And many times, the ability to choose samples in a smart way, which I think of as like improving the quality of our data, um, can mitigate, mitigate the lack of data quantity. So we might not have a lot of samples, but we can choose exactly what uh, data examples get labeled, and that can really work in our favor to, to have a huge benefit. Okay, so um, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this example because I'll come back to it later in the talk. A classic example here is a really, really simple problem. I have a function on the line and just for scaling, think about it as a function defined between negative one and one. And I want to approximate that function by a polynomial. A well-known result is that if I uniformly sample points from the function and then try to fit, so meaning I uniformly sample locations on the x-axis and then I observe the function at those locations. Um, if I want to find an accurate approximation to the polynomial, I will require order D squared uniform samples. But if I'm smarter about where I look at the function, in particular, there are sampling strategies, we'll talk about them, which concentrate samples more towards the boundary of the interval negative one, that can be reduced quadratically to an order D sample complexity. So we'll get back to this, but there are many problems where choosing exactly where you look at the function can have a huge um, impact on how many samples you need to accurately approximate. Okay, so this is the general problem statement. This problem of how to choose the samples in a smart way is often called active learning or experimental design. So experimental design or optimal experimental design, this is like the traditional statistics term for this problem. It was, it's, a, it's an area that was founded in a, a thesis from over 100 years ago by Danish statistician Kirsten Smith, um, who she was a PhD student of Pearson um, and has been studied for decades in statistics. More recently, the machine learning community has become very interested in this idea of how to collect samples or what data to label if you if it's expensive to label data. And we typically in, in the machine learning community would refer to that as active machine learning. Um, I, I think of these names, optimal experimental design and active machine learning as really just different names for the same the same topic of study. So I'll, I'll refer to it as active machine learning. OK, um, any questions about the basic problem setup? Okay, um, there are many techniques for experimental design or active machine learning. There are classical methods from statistics, optimal experimental design methods, which seek to like reduce the variance of your, of your design strategy in some sense. There are greedy algorithms. Um, the problem is closer related to reinforcement learning type problems like bandit methods or linear bandit methods. So there are methods coming from that community. Um, there are diversity maximization methods which seek to sort of like optimize the diversity of your samples, like determinantal point process sampling. Tons of different methods out there. Uh, some of the, these methods are heuristic. They have limited theoretical guarantees. Others have like strong theoretical guarantees that you can prove, but typically 
those strong theoretical guarantees require very strong assumptions about your problem. For example, your target function is bounded or you have IID sample noise. Like uh, we'll talk about that in a second. The main thing I'm interested in for this talk, and I've just been interested in generally in my research recently, is can we develop active learning methods with strong provable guarantees, but with very, very limited assumptions on the active learning setup. So you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna formalize the problem of what I call agnostic active learning. Agnostic is a term used in machine learning to refer to some, the, the adversarial noise setting. So we'll talk about exactly what that is. Um, I'm gonna describe one approach to solving this very challenging agnostic active learning problem for linear functions based on something called leverage score sampling, which gives near optimal sample complexity for the set of linear functions. And I think it's a really interesting method. We're gonna sort of motivate it from first principles. What I like about the leverage score sampling methods, it has a lot of flexibility. So it can be extended to active learning in infinite data domains. Uh, when your goal is minimizing unusual loss functions, um, it can be extended to simple neural network models. Uh, lots and lots of interesting extensions of this leverage score sampling framework to attack different but related problems. Um, so we'll touch on that towards the end of the talk. Um, and just in general, uh, this is the work in this talk is like, I, I listed all my collaborators below. Some are students or colleagues from NYU and then some from, are from outside NYU, but sort of split up, uh, split up amongst a bunch of different papers that we've had on these topics. Okay, so let's formalize the problem. There's a ton of ways to formalize this question. I'm just picking one that is I think easy to understand and it's the most native to my, I, I usually work on algorithms for linear algebra. So this view of the problem is like most native to how I think about machine learning problems, um, but it's just one possible formalization. So, okay, my setup is as follows. We have a matrix A, which I'm thinking of as N by D with rows A1 through AN. These are unlabeled data examples. So the columns of the matrix represent features and the rows represent data examples, each with D different features. We are from those features trying to predict some unobserved target vector Y. So I've shown this as a vector, but we're only gonna try to look at a small number of entries in Y, because that corresponds to our sample cost. How many examples do we need to look at to fit the function? Um, and then also we have some function class, uh, capital H, which maps uh, D-dimensional data examples to real values, because ideally we're going to try to find some mapping from the rows of A to what we're trying to predict, which is the entries in Y. So we could think of the function class as linear functions. In this case, for any H in our function class, H of AI, so the function applied to AI, would equal W transpose AI, where W transpose is just like a, a weight factor. So when I say linear functions, that's what I'm talking about. Um, alternatively, we could have our function class be like the set of all neural networks with some structure. So like A gets passed into a neural network, and then these are like tunable weights in the neural network, and that spits out a real value, which would be H of AI. Um, we should think of N as really large. So that's going to be huge, and we're going to try to be collecting much, much less than N examples. So looking at a very, very small number of the entries in Y. Um, you, we could also think of A as containing samples from some distribution, or even we'll consider cases when N can be fine, infinite. Don't worry about it for now. Just think of N as very large and finite for the time being. Okay, so that's our setup. One thing I'll note before going on is that for a lot of the problems I'm going to be talking about, we also further think of the rows in A as feature transformations of points in some other space. So I showed you a lot of points in like problems in two dimensions. I want to approximate this function over two dimensional space. This is often the case in parametric PDEs. You're fitting functions over like reasonably low dimensional space, like dimension less than 10. Um, when I think of a data point here, I'm not just thinking of it as like the two dimensional X, Y coordinate. Typically we're thinking of A as containing some feature transformations of low dimensional data points. So if I had, for example, one dimensional data points, X1 through Xn, we're drawing the real line, I might have a feature vector AI corresponding to each Xi, which contains like all the polynomial terms involving Xi, one Xi, Xi squared, so on and so forth. In this case, a linear model with the features in AI would correspond to fitting a polynomial in the original data point Xi. 
or my X's could be in two dimensional space and I might be fitting like two to two dimensional polynomials uh, by putting all the polynomial features in my rows of A. Okay, so just, just like uh, an important thing, like D is our number of features. It's not necessarily like the, the intrinsic dimension of the problem where the, the original dimension of the problem we're solving. Okay, uh, so that's the setup. We have this matrix A with rows A1 through, A1 through AN. Our goal is after observing some number of samples M, which is gonna, the goal is to have it much, much less than the length of Y from, from Y. We wanna find some approximately optimal hypothesis in our class, which I'm denoting as H tilde, such that if I apply H entry to the rows of A, so I'm denoting that by H tilde of A, the squared error between that and my target Y is less than some constant C times H star of A minus Y, where H star of A is the best hypothesis in my class. So the one that minimizes the squared error to Y. Okay, so C is gonna be some constant greater than one. In general, if we want C to be smaller, we're gonna require more samples. We'll talk about cases when C could be as small as one plus epsilon for some parameter epsilon that the user gets to set. But it's also interesting, like in many applications, to consider the case when C is two or 10. Like you can ask for a coarse approximation or a fine approximation, either is interesting. Um, but this is, the, this is the goal of this active learning problem. Notice there's no, nothing distributional about this. There's no randomness. Um, it's just like a fixed A and a fixed Y that we're trying to collect, collect samples from. Okay. Um, so yeah, along those lines, this is a very strong guarantee. So it makes no assumption on Y. In particular, we make no assumption that it is close to a target in the hypothesis class. So in machine learning, this is why this would be called the agnostic learning setting or the adversarial noise setting. It's generally considered harder than what we call the realizable setting, where Y would equal some true hypothesis in your class applied to A plus an IEID noise vector, like a, a noise vector eta whose entries are, say, like bounded random variables with mean zero. Um, so that's an easier setting because we know there's a good hypothesis in the class to approximate Y. In our setting, there might not be a good hypothesis in the class, but even when that's the case, we still wanna find something competitive with the best hypothesis. Okay, any questions about the guarantee? Okay, good. Yeah, so uh, as I said, we don't make any assumptions that Y equals like some true hypothesis class, but noise. And why do we care about this? Like, it, it, is it just a little bit overkill to ask for this sort of strong guarantee? I think it's very well motivated in most of the applications I talked about. So in most of the applications I talked about, we expect to have models misspecification. We're trying to approximate like a low dimensional function by say high degree polynomials or uh, Gaussian process models or Fourier functions. We don't actually believe that the solution of this differential equation, the quantity of interest, is a low degree polynomial. It's just some relatively smooth functions in, in high dimensions. Similarly, we don't believe the trade-off between uh, like reaction parameters and the efficiency of the chemical process is actually a low degree polynomial. It's going to be some other function, which we just hope is well approximated by it. So it allows for model misspecification. And this is very easy to see, like if you look at examples uh, like this is the simple harmonic oscillator example I have had earlier. If you find the true function y and then the best fit in some hypothesis class, we're calling that h star, and you look at the difference between those two, you'll notice that the differences between y and the optimal hypothesis are pretty correlated, right? Like in this region, we're underestimating in this region, or sorry, overestimating in this region, we're underestimating. It's certainly not like IID noise added to some true hypothesis. Y has systematic errors away from the true optimal. Okay. Um, another thing that's like important to notice about this goal is because it's a bit stronger than the realizable setting, um, you probably cannot achieve this objective with any deterministic method for collecting samples. So like pretty much all methods in traditional experimental design, like for that study in the statistics community are deterministic. They look at your matrix A and they pick what, what rows they're gonna sample with a deterministic algorithm. This is not possible in to, if you have a deterministic method, you cannot achieve this sort of guarantee. And here's like a simple like argument for why that's the case. 
suppose I knew your algorithm was going, say I'm doing polynomial regression on the line, which can be, as we said, could be phrased as linear regression. Suppose I knew your algorithm is gonna sample from these set of like six points. What I could do is create a target Y, which is as follows. It's something that has a very good polynomial approximation in general, except there's some spiky errors in the function exactly at the deterministic set of points you wanted to sample. So like uh, if you sampled at those points, you would actually see the function values here. You would say, oh, why is approximated by this linear function, which would be very, very bad. It'd be very far from the optimal L2 polynomial approximation of this function. Okay, so that might seem a little silly. Okay, there's no way your function in practice is gonna concentrate error exactly at the deterministic set of points you tried to sample it at. And I totally agree with that. But for this problem, what I'm gonna to try to do is develop like uh, theoretically robust methods. So methods with strong theoretical guarantees to motivate the design of methods that work well in practice. And if we're gonna care about getting strong theoretical guarantees, um, we're gonna to need to have randomized methods. I'm not saying that deterministic methods necessarily work poorly in practice. They probably do, but it, it's, it would be impossible to analyze them in this worst case setting. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about one method in particular, which is in the title of the talk, and this is leverage core sampling. Uh, so here's the claim of a theorem that has sort of simultaneously, like was discovered sort of independently in a number of different communities. Like I was first made aware of this theorem in a paper by Sarlos from 2006, um, who who's comes from the perspective of randomized linear algebra, but it's also separately proven in a paper by Rahut Ward or Cohen Migliorati from 2015. Uh, suppose H contains linear functions. So H of A equals AW for some weight vector W. So your function is just you take W and inner product with all the rows of A. Then you can solve the agnostic active learning problem so you can achieve this guarantee with m equals d log d samples using a randomized method known as leverage core sampling. And actually, if you want to get down to one plus epsilon error and not just some constant c, you can do d log d plus d over epsilon samples will get you the guarantee. Um, okay, this is pretty cool. So actually, like, We'll talk about this later. Order D over epsilon samples is optimal for this problem. So this gets within a log factor of optimal. And it's pretty much getting you like the lowest sample complexity you could get. Like for a D-dimensional linear regression problem, there's no way you're going to get by with less than D samples. And this is just getting you a log factor off of that. Okay, so it's a cool method. The next part of the talk is we're going to try to motivate this leverage score sampling method. Um, from first principles, so I can get you guys all on the same page, understand how these how these sorts of methods work. Okay, does the theorem theorem make sense? I'll keep checking in, but if it, if it's all fine, you can just be quiet. Okay. Yeah. So, how does leverage score sampling work? I said that we need deterministic methods cannot solve the agnostic active learning problem, so we need randomness in some way the sort of most naive thing you could do is you could just randomly sample rows from a say uniformly this is actually the setting of standard machine learning right like if you think of the the distribution we're learning over is the uniform distribution on a which it is because we're doing the l2 loss just the standard l2 loss on a um, that would be what a standard non-active machine learning algorithm does it uniformly samples from a the idea behind leverage for sampling is we're, we're gonna not uh, deviate from that too much we're still going to sample rows of a randomly but we're going to do it using a non-uniform probability distribution so in particular what i'm going to do is i'm going to assign for every row in a a probability like p1 p2 all the way down to pn so here like these bars are meant to represent the probabilities p2 is higher than p1 in this case and then i'm going to think about just like walking through my matrix and i flip a coin with probability p1 if it comes up heads, I keep the, that row. If it comes up tails, I don't keep it. So on and so forth. And if I keep a row, I mean, I collect the label for that row. So I independently walk through the rows, sampling with different probabilities. And then I label the rows where my coin comes up heads. Okay, so very similar to uniform sampling, except we have these probabilities. And the goal is going to be to collect sort of like more important rows with higher probability 
when we're doing this sampling process, bros that matter more in the in the learning process. Okay, so um, I want to be a bit more formal about it just to like write down how exactly how the method is going to work. As I said, we pick this probability P1 through PN for every row, and then we'll we'll flip a coin with probably PI for every row. What we're actually going to do is construct a sampling matrix out of that. So if the coin comes up heads, I'm going to, the sampling matrix is going to be diagonal matrix. A is a uh, height N matrix. This is an N by N diagonal matrix. So everything off diagonal is zeros. On the diagonal for any row that I choose to keep that's going to get labeled, I put a one over square root of the probability I sample that row with. So one over square root of P1 in the first uh, row, one over square root of P3 in the third. And then if I do not sample a row, so I, I'm not going to label it, I just put a zero on the diagonal. I call that my sampling matrix S. Um, I'm doing this for waiting to keep things correct in expectation. So what this is going to ensure is that no matter what my sampling distribution is, if I look at a fixed hypothesis H in my class, the expected value of SHA minus SY, two norm squared, will equal HA minus Y, two norm squared under this reweighting. So that's not too hard to check. The reason I'm doing reweighting by the square root of the probability is because I have a two norm squared. So ultimately that's going to get squared when I compute the squared error. Okay, so if I reweight in this way, I have this very natural property. The two norm of SHA minus SY, at least an expectation, is a good approximation for HA minus Y for any of hypothesis. So a reasonable thing to do is you just solve this sampled and rescaled problem. You just find the H tilde, which minimizes SHA minus SY, given the sampling matrix S. Computing SY only requires looking at M entries in Y if I collected M samples, right? So if my probability is sum to M, I'm gonna collect roughly M samples. Um, yeah, and then uh, I will only have to look at M entries in my target vector Y to compute this estimate H tilde. Okay, so that's the, that's in general how the important sampling method is going to work, but I have to tell you exactly how I'm going to collect these important samples. Um, okay, so the first observation is if we're going to try to design a method for this, we, we might want to think about how we would analyze such a method. We already said that in expectation, SHA minus SY equals HA minus HY for all hypotheses. So a common approach in machine learning when you're trying to like analyze the sample complexity of problems is to aim for something that we would call uniform convergence. So, okay, don't just show that SHA minus SY is good, is, is correct in expectation, but show it's like close to the true error for that hypothesis in with high probability. So you might say, show that for all H in our hypothesis class, SHA minus SY is approximately equal to within some upper and lower bound, HA minus Y. Um, Proving this sort of guarantee is actually sort of out of the question in the agnostic setting. Uh, you cannot prove this sort of guarantee. And I think it's, it's like useful to see why. It's a similar example to what I had before about why randomness is necessary. Imagine I have a function y, which is like very well approximated by a low degree polynomial, but it has a really big spike in one location, which is gonna increase the error of any low degree polynomial approximation to the function unless I literally sample a data point at that spike, which I do not know about in advance because this target Y, which I'm thinking of as a function here between negative one and one, this target Y is unknown. I won't know to sample there. I won't see the spike. So I'll basically like underestimate the error of any function with extremely high probability. So yeah, maybe I get the thing correct in expectation, but there's no way to argue that I concentrate around the, the that SHA minus SY concentrates closely around HA minus. Although you might observe that actually for any hypothesis in my class, if my classes say low degree polynomials, we'll all sort of all uh, estimate the error in the same wrong way. So for all low degree polynomials, we'll sort of like underestimate the error for this example, right? We like won't see the spike there, so we won't see the deviation from the smooth part of the function. So maybe that's okay. Like it means that we'll think every function is better than it is, but sort of an equal way. So if we minimize SHA minus SY, we might hope to find uh, a near optimal function. Okay, and that turns out to be exactly true. So uh, there's many, many ways to analyze these sampling methods, in particular leverage core sampling. 
but I'm gonna I'm just gonna explain one one simple way. This is gonna be like the most technical part of the talk, but I think it gives you a picture of like what things need to be proven to show that this stuff works. I claim that it suffices to show that your subsampling matrix with high probability preserves the L2 distance between your best hypothesis in the class and any other hypothesis in the class. So in other words, that two norm of SHA minus SH star A approximately equals HA minus H star A with high probability for all H in the function class. So this is easier to prove than uniform convergence because I've replaced Y here with H star A something else in my function class, which is not an unknown. Like I, I understand what my function class looks like. Okay, so um, here's the claim. Let H star be the best function in your function class approximating Y. Uh, and I'm just gonna, for ease of notation, call H star A minus Y opt. That's the best L2 -er I could hope for. Let S be your, your sampling matrix. If we have that for all other hypotheses in my class, um, SHA minus SH star A is a constant factor. So within a multiplicative, like one half, two factor approximation to HA minus H star A in the two norm, then H tilde, which is the minimum of my sampled problem, will satisfy H tilde A minus Y is less than a constant times opt, which is exactly what we want. That's the, that's the agnostic active learning guarantee, at least for a constant C. I'm not going to show you how to do it for one plus epsilon. That lemma is important. So it's important that we reduce down to this statement. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Like what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping to prove and what the, the condition I'm asking for is? Okay. Um, yeah, so that's a lemma. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but I thought I would throw the proofs on the slide because it's important to know that it's like a five line proof. The only things we use basically are triangle inequality and Markov's inequality. So you just like, you just write H tilde of A minus Y, you split it up with triangle inequality into the difference between H tilde A minus H star of A and H star of A minus Y. And then it's a bunch of just like applying this statement a couple of times. You have to use Markov's inequality once to say that SH star A minus SY is not a huge, it's not too much larger than H star of A minus Y. But pretty much that's all the tools that are needed. It's a six line proof. Um, it is quite a bit more complicated to get one plus epsilon guarantees and the arguments are like a little bit delicate. So I won't go into that. This approach I'm talking about truly only gives a constant factor guarantee. But let's just like take it as that is interesting for some problems and we'll move forward only caring about constant factor guarantees for now. Okay, so we've boiled down the problem to understanding this condition. I need to preserve the distance between any hypothesis in my class and the optimal hypothesis in my class. When I have linear models, which is the case leverage scores have these strong provable guarantees for, this can be rewritten. So this is saying that I want let W be any weights from my linear model and let W star be the optimal weights. I want that AW, the two norm of AW minus AW star is well approximated to within a constant factor by the two norm of S of AW minus S of AW star. Um, I can just factor this out, right? So this is the same as writing like one half two norm of AW minus W star. I'll just write it this way approximately equals S A W minus W star. So certainly to prove this guarantee, it would be fine if I could show that with high probability, S A X approximates A X for all vectors X, because then I just apply it for the X, which equals W minus W star. This is a well-known guarantee. So at least like in, in my community in theoretical computer science, we typically refer to this as a subspacing getting guarantee. I want to find some sampling matrix such that with high probability, SAX approximately equals two norm of AX for all X. Okay. Um, it, these guarantees have been super well studied. So I, one of the first places they became popular in theoretical computer science was in understanding um, graph sparsification methods. So there's a beautiful line of work by Spielman Tang and, and Srivastava as well, 
on spectral sparsifiers for graphs, which have all sorts of algorithmic applications. Basically, the idea is you take a dense graph and you remove a bunch of the edges to get a sparse graph, but then argue that you can do operations on the sparse graph that approximate the dense graph. So these are like uh, very well used, and it turns out you can frame the graph sparsification problem exactly as a subspace embedding problem. Subspace embeddings have also been important in randomized numerical linear algebra. So the idea there is to use random sketching and sampling matrices to speed up linear algebra algorithms. One thing we often try to prove is that those sketching or sampling matrices satisfy subspace embedding guarantees. And then that allows them to be used for things like approximate low rank approximation. Okay, so how do we ensure such a guarantee via sampling? Um, here's how I like to think of it, and it, it gives an understanding of these uh, these leverage scores. Let's just consider how we would insert, ensure such a guarantee for a single choice of vector x. So I want SAX to approximately equal AX. AX is just a vector, right? But its entries could be large or they could be small. Some will be large and small. If I knew what x was, how would I ensure that SAX approximately equals AX? A standard thing you would do is you would sample the vector so that you sample larger elements with higher probability. And in particular, by just like a standard Bernstein inequality, if I take m equals like log one over delta over alpha squared samples, uh, as long as I set my probabilities proportional to the squared entry size, so I'm going to note that by the ith entry of ax, which I'm noting by ax sub i squared over the some of the ith entry squared, so over ax2 norm squared, as long as my probabilities are proportional to that, then if I take m samples where m is like log one over delta, order log one over delta, I will get that sax2 norm is like a one plus alpha approximation to ax2 norm with probability one minus delta. So I can't uniform sample. So uniform sample, I could miss heavy entries, and then I'll get like a very bad approximation because those dominate the two norm of ax. But as long as I sample with probability proportional to the squared value of the entry, the entry, I'm in good shape. Okay, so actually, for single x, this problem is easy. The challenge is getting it to hold for all x simultaneously. But leverage score sampling does this in a very natural way. So in particular, we say that look at different choices for x. Depending on how you choose x, the heavy entries in the vector ax could lie in different places, right? So like, this choice X, the heaviest entry is here. This one is here, this one is here. So like, how do I choose a sampling distribution if the heavy entries move around depending on the choice of X? The idea behind leverage score is just to be super conservative. Sample every entry with the worst possible probability, with the highest probability it could have had for any choice of X. So you just set the leverage score formally is equal to the maximum overall choices of x of this sampling probability, axi squared over two norm of ax squared. So for all choices of x, what's the largest that entry could have been relative to the size of the entries in the rest of the vector, okay? I'm denoting that by tau i, which is just known as the statistical leverage score of the matrix A. It's only of A now because it doesn't depend on x. It's defined as this maximization problem over x. Okay, so... Um, yeah, these statistical leverage scores are really nice to work with because they have a clean closed form expression. This, this maximization problem has a closed form expression. If I want to find the X, which maximizes it for particular I, I compute A transpose A inverse times AI, where AI is the ith row of my matrix. And then you can plug it in and you can check that that means the leverage score is the quadratic form of AI, the ith row over A transpose A inverse. Um, the sum of these leverage scores, one way of writing it is the trace of A times A transpose A inverse A transpose. That's just summing up this expression. By cyclic property of trace, you can maybe see that this is just the trace of a D by D identity matrix. So they always sum to D, which has nothing to do with the height of the matrix A. It only has to do with the width D. So I find this sort of a surprising fact. I said, you're going to take the maximum probability over all choices of X. And you might think that that could be a really bad thing to do. Maybe like I'll have to sample every entry in the, in the vector with high probability, but it doesn't work out that way. So no matter what, no matter what A looks like, the sum of the leverage scores is always exactly equal to D. You'll never have to take 
you're like when you do your sampling you'll never have to take like more than a d factor more samples than if you had sampled for a single x at one time okay so the punchline there is if we set p equal to some scaling my probability equals some scale and leverage square um as long as i set m to be log one over delta then by scalar bernstein inequality if i take order d log one over delta samples i will have that sax is very closely approximated very closely approximates ax2 norm for any single x basically i can do a naive epsilon net argument i can union bound over all x in a d-dimensional subspace this would give me something slightly suboptimal like a d squared bound or i can use more clever like uh high dimensional probability techniques like matrix turnoff bounds or refined net type analyses. And I would get that down to just D log D samples needed to preserve the norm of SAX for all X simultaneously. Okay, so um, this is the final result. As I stated, if you sample D log D plus D over epsilon samples via leverage score, you, you solve this agnostic learning problem for linear functions. Okay, and also this method tends to work really well in practice. So here's like, an example, the example I showed at the beginning of the talk, where I'm trying to estimate some quantity of interest for this driven harmonic oscillator. I'm trying to approximate this pretty complex looking function with degree 20 polynomials in two dimensions, which I can frame as a linear problem by a feature transformation. If I take 350 uniform samples, I get the image on the left. So tons of artifacts around the edges. I do not do a nice job approximating the function. If I take the same number of leverage core samples, I pretty much nail exactly what that function looks like in two-dimensional space. It's a simple to implement me method because the leverage cores have this clean closed form expression. You just compute them and sample by them. And then you solve a weighted least squares regression problem to get our final fit. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the claim. This was actually recently improved to order D over epsilon in a result by Chen and Price from Colt 2019. So you can remove this log D factor. That's a really cool paper. Like. Uh, I think there was something people asked for a long time, but it was it was difficult to do. They basically leveraged techniques from the literature on graph sparsification, which is also interested in removing log factors to show that there are slightly better methods in theory, which I think is cool. Okay. Um, one thing I find cool about leverage scores is they're very flexible and adaptable. So even though the analysis I just talked to you about is for agnostic learning for linear functions, They've been extended to say doing things beyond L2 loss. We can do LP norms and other losses. They can be used for logistic regression. They can be used for what I call union of subspace models. These aren't linear problems, but they're things like, uh, like uh, sparse Fourier functions or sparse polynomials, which it's like a linear problem, but you also get to select as only a small number of columns in the matrix A. Um, they can be extended to kernel regression problems, which is basically linear models with an infinite number of features. And then we'll talk a little bit at the very end about extensions to neural networks. Okay, so um, before I do that, I want to talk about a really cool connection between leverage scores and classical function interpolation. So at this point in talk, things are going to get a bit less technical. We won't have as much math, but I hope you recognize some things you've seen before. So one of the running examples I've been talking about is polynomial approximation. People probably have seen in like their undergrad numerical analysis class polynomial approximation before. Like if I want to fit a function by a low degree polynomial, degree Q polynomial, say on the line, just in one dimensions, how would I do that? Um, the classical approach is you do like polynomial interpolation. And typically what you learn is you should interpolate the function at the Chebyshev nodes. So the Chebyshev nodes are obtained by, you draw a semicircle, you do evenly spaced points in the Chebyshev, the semicircle, and you drop them down to a lot, the line. They're also the roots of the degree Q Chebyshev polynomial. So they have the property that they sort of concentrate closer to the edges of the interval. Why do you do this? The reason we use Chebyshev nodes, oh, before I even talk about that, this is the same picture in two dimensions. So these things can be extended to two dimensions just by taking like the, you know, natural tensor product of the one dimensional points. Okay, so those are two dimensional Chebyshev nodes. Why do we do this? Uh, basically because it avoids Runga's phenomenon which is the idea that if instead of using these Chebyshev nodes that are sort of spaced in this funny way, if I had taken a uniform grid of points on the line and tried to interpolate a polynomial, I can get ringing artifacts near the edge of the interval. So you can see this for even like very simple functions. Like this is sort of a famous one. It looks like the polynomial is doing fine because it was very poorly near the edge of the interval. Of the interval. So it makes sense. Chebyshev nodes concentrate more samples there. So 
to sort of make sure you don't mess up where uniform interpolation would mess up. Um, as I said, you can't get theoretical guarantees for something like Chebyshev interpolation for polynomials in our agnostic learning setting, because you need to use randomness, but you can give theoretical guarantees in a different norm. So if, if you are promised that your function is uniformly well approximated by a polynomial, so you're looking at the L infinity norm instead of the L2 norm, you can get theoretical guarantees for this method. Um, there's actually a really close connection between the leverage scores and the Chebyshev nodes. So if I do leverage score sampling, on the left, I have uniform random samples. And on the right, I have leverage score samples collected for 2D polynomial regression. You can see that these leverage score samples almost mimic what Chebyshev nodes are doing. They're concentrating samples near the edges and corner of the box I'm fitting over, just like Chebyshev nodes would do. Okay. Um, I want to try to explain why this is the case. So in this setting, I'm going to consider sort of an infinite dimensional limit where A, my data matrix, think of it as an infinitely tall matrix. It contains a row AT for every point T on the interval negative one to one, because I just want to think about like the continuous polynomial interpolation problem. And then in that row, I have all the degree Q polynomial features for T. Okay. In this case, I can still write down what the leverage score is. The leverage score of a, of a row T is equal to this maximization problem. It turns out that for polynomials, what's the top of that fraction? It's just the poly, some polynomial evaluated at T. And what's the bottom of the fraction? It's the L2 norm of some polynomial evaluated at all values of T between negative one and one. So the leverage score is exactly equal to the maximum over all degree Q polynomials of PT squared over the integral from negative one to one of PS squared DS. So it's equal to the squared magnitude of the polynomial that T divided by its average magnitude over the integral. Okay, that feels like a very like nice form for this leverage score. And actually it's been extremely well studied. So if you just invert this, and instead you take the minimum of the inverse of that fraction, which is exactly equal to one over the leverage score, this has a name. It's known as the polynomial Christoffel function, and it's been like super well studied in the approximation theory and community and other communities. Um, bounding this function is closely related to things like Markov brothers inequalities or Bernstein type bounds for low degree polynomials. What these inequalities say is they look at a polynomial which is bounded, and they say bounded polynomials can't, meaning it has an upper and lower bound on it, can't have too high of derivatives. And the derivatives sort of depend on where you live in the interval. So if I have a bounded polynomial in the center of the interval, I can't have derivatives much higher than D or Q, where Q is my degree. And even at the edge of the interval, I can't have derivatives much higher than Q squared, where Q is my uh, degree. So people understand how to bound these Christoffel functions. And I don't know the exact right citation for this, but it can be proven like a million different ways. One thing you can do is you can prove that these leverage scores tau t for the polynomial approximation problem are always upper bounded by some constant times my polynomial degree times this really simple function just one over one minus t squared so this is a function that actually like asymptotes to infinity near negative one and one you can prove a slightly tighter bound but it doesn't matter too much that the leverage scores also never get above q squared but certainly you can prove they're always less than this function c q times square root of one minus t squared. Um, this fun this approximation is tight in that it integrates to order q and the true leverage score is sum to q. So it's not tight in the sense that like there might be some leverage scores that are like quite a bit below the function, but the integral is the same as what you would get if you summed up the true leverage scores. It's an upper bound on the leverage scores. And the other thing that's really cool is this function is actually exactly the asymptotic density of the Chebyshev nodes. So if you look at the Chebyshev nodes as n goes to infinity, they have some density on the interval, it will match this function in the limit. And actually also in the limit as the degree of the polynomials go up, this, this less than or equal to becomes an equality. So in the limit, like both of these methods sort of like are at least collecting things asymptotically the same, the Chebyshev nodes just from a deterministic grid and the leverage scores in a randomized way. Okay, so um, I want to wrap up by just talking about some like I think I've explained leverage scores to you guys. I think they're a really cool object. 
I love this connection to these classical things like Chebyshev polynomials and classical polynomial interpolation. I want to just give you three really quick takeaways that's come out of that connection. So first is, uh, it's interesting to me that we could solve the L infinity and L2 polynomial approximation problems using very similar techniques. Recently, we've been able to leverage this to get uh, bounds for other P norms. So like one thing we proved using this connection recently was that actually for degree Q polynomials, Q over epsilon to the P samples. So if epsilon's a constant, roughly O tilde Q, I'm hiding log factors there. Samples suffice to solve the optimal polynomial approximation problem on the interval for any P norm. So you can actually move between this like L2 and L infinity norm, which is cool. Um, another interesting takeaway here is if we can get a closed form upper bound on the leverage course for some function class, like polynomials over two dimensional space, we don't need to actually compute the leverage scores, which is not hard because it's like a simple, it's like a one line operation in MATLAB, but it could be computationally expensive because it requires computing A transpose A inverse. And even building this data matrix A might be expensive. Uh, so this basically says you can do it for free. If you have a closed form upper bound, you can sample from that upper bound without ever building A and without ever computing the leverage scores explicitly. So people have been really interested in this, myself included, People have proven closed form upper bounds on uh, the leverage scores for sparse Fourier functions. I have some citations here for sparse polynomials and other constrained classes of sparse polynomials, like those that have something called lower set structure. We've done some work here on band limited functions and Gaussian process regression models, which is kernel regression models. Um, so that's a cool takeaway. And then maybe uh, the last thing I'll mention is that this connection to grid based sampling methods like Chebyshev sampling. Um, can lead to some interesting new ideas for practical methods. So one thing we observed in our experiments is that often you use leverage scores and you'll use Chebyshev samples. And for many problems, the Chebyshev grid samples will perform quite well, um, even though they don't have the same theoretical guarantees for this agnostic learning problem. And I think part of the reason for that is that random sampling inherently just makes mistakes sometimes. Like, Look at the random samples I collected here via leverage scores. I have two points here that are almost on top of each other. If I sample my function at that, that spot, those two spots, I'm not gaining much additional information by having two samples there instead of one. So one thing that's nice about the grid-based methods is sort of spatially uniform. They never accidentally put samples too close together, like is bound to happen with random sampling, even if you use independent sampling. Um, but it turns out you can sort of interpolate between the two methods. So um, I'm gonna post this preprint online, like hopefully literally tonight. We have some recent work with two students at um, NYU, Atsushi Shimuzu and Charlotte Chang, and then Jonathan Weir, who's also here, on improved active learning via dependent leverage score sampling. So one thing we were able to do is use the same important sampling distribution as leverage scores, but use a dependent negatively correlated sampling method, which drives points away from each other. So you can think like it, while you're doing the sampling, it, you, you try not to sample points closer to any points you've sampled previously. Um, and we can prove that this, these sort of sampling methods have the same guarantees as leverage score sampling, same strong theoretical guarantees, but can reduce your number of samples in practice by up to 50%. So here's like an example problem there. We're using the same number of samples. We get a much better fit with one of these pivotal dependent sampling methods than uniform sampling. Um, Okay, so that's like three things we've done with this connection. Uh, what are future directions? Everything I've talked about is pretty much for linear models or union of sp subspace models. We're really interested in pushing beyond that. So in particular, we want to understand agnostic active learning methods for neural networks. Active learning is for neural networks has been studied in the easier realizable setting, but there are many, many less guarantees in the agnostic setting. And we don't even know exactly what the right methods are. There's been some initial work on extending leverage scores to the setting. So Ben Adcock um, and some others, Cardenas and Dexter, have a result from last year that uses like a cool linearization trick to apply uh, leverage score sampling in an iterative way to deep neural networks. Hard to get theoretical guarantees there, but like you can get some pretty cool practical results. And then we have some recent results which give theoretical guarantees for learning very restrictive classes of one layer neural networks. So we can learn ridge functions actually using unmodified leverage score sampling, meaning we can fit functions of the form G A W, where G is some like nonlinearity. So like this is a one layer neural network. But I think there's a lot of questions to be asked there and hopefully uh, 
that's something we can push further on in the next couple of years. Okay, so I think I went a little bit over my 50 minutes, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, let's all uh, thank the speaker uh, by smashing that uh, clapping reaction button. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Uh,